All right, so today we're taking a look at another uh, design doc video. Today we're looking at Good and Bad Design Volume 2. So if you you may have noticed that we're actually skipping a couple of the design doc videos. Uh, basically, I mean, this series of videos is not supposed to be an only design doc react kind of uh, series. Uh, but instead, just talk about also other channels and other uh, videos about game design in general. And the other reason I st decided to skip as well is that design doc... Uh, one of the issues I have with Design Doc, actually, even though his videos are pretty good, is that he mostly talks about JRPGs and, and specific game genres in, in many series. Like, for the looks of it, he mostly talks about Nintendo games and then PlayStation games as well as mostly JRPGs, uh, which is fine. I mean, it's obviously the games that he probably plays himself, which makes sense that he would talk about them. But, which means that a lot of the videos that I actually uh, skipped are videos that I thought were... Uh, too focused on a very specific type of games, very specific uh, topic. So I decided to skip, to skip them so we can go through his videos a little bit faster as well. And I can start looking at uh, all the channels uh, faster, I guess. So anyways, let's take a look at good and bad design. So I could, again, uh, we're talking about graphic design examples. And uh, like in the previous video, he mostly talks about uh, what a good design is and what a bad design is. And a good design ends up being basically not only something that is useful and, uh, you know, that does its job properly and that, you know, reduces the amounts of clicks necessary uh, to do certain things that is usable and visible and understandable very quickly, but it's also something that uh, works thematically with uh, the actual game. And bad designs, well, are, I guess, the opposite of both. So anyways, let's uh, look at this examples. Second verse, same as the first. These are six more great and not great examples of graphic design in games. Just as a reminder, while graphic design might seem like the same thing as art, it's really not. Mm -hmm. Graphic design is visual communication. It's things like menus, UI, camera work, color choice, font choice, animation, character design, the presentation of information. Good graphic design is a mix of usability and style. That like in a way, the way that the way that I would separate it is that uh, art is just the game itself, the game assets in a way. So in this case, it would be the character itself, the you know the 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 you know the the actual level. And, and so on and graphic design it would be the ui as well as the decision to make uh the health visible in the character itself and uh and so on and again obviously all the fonts and so on it, it is part of it and uh in a way yeah the fact that you know the ui might be animated and stuff you could consider that uh graphic design helps well. you know what you need to know bad graphic design is anything else style at odds with usability usability without style or if you're really unlucky, both. Making it harder to melt into a game. Good design. Splatoon is one of the most inventive shooters in years, and one of the major keys to its success is how well the designers at Nintendo thought through the game's use of color contrast. Splatoon relies on color contrast to guide players to the game's primary objective, totally paint the yeah. most terrain in your team's color. As the match plays out, your mini-map will update in real time, highlighting where your team is, where your opponents are fighting back, and what still needs to be covered. One of the things that I think, uh, for me, mostly... Like, I, I feel like it is mostly like this way when, uh, when I talk about good uh, graphic design, is that it seems very basic and very simple right in the sense that here you have a very quick mini map that you can glance at but then most of the screen is empty and then you just have the top that has a little bit of information and that's it right everything else is empty like usually other games have like a bunch of shit everywhere and that ends up being too Splatoon much Splatoon uses a few tricks from color theory to make sure you can know all of that information with just a quick glance here is the same so in this case you have uh, the overall map and of course, it's using takes advantage of the colors. In this case, a lot of big contrast uh, that makes you really see 
the progression of the game very quickly but then there's not much more information other than that it shows the different players in very separated locations in the in the in the in the space i guess and then you have a little bit of extra information if you want to check but this it's not crowded nope oh, somehow muted dining it. a color scheme Let me go back the make sure you can know all of that information with just a quick glance of the map the key is in the color combinations of the ink. If you're designing a color scheme, there's one thing that you generally want to avoid. Color vibration. If there are two adjacent colors that are similar in brightness, the colors can vibrate and blur at the edges. This can be a common problem with true complementary color schemes, like blue-orange, red-green, and yellow-purple. Color vibration is intense, uncomfortable to look at, and even sometimes causing colorblind people to have trouble telling two hues apart. In Splatoon, the two paint colors will be next to each other all the time, just mm -hmm. by the nature of the game. It's unavoidable, so how does Splatoon avoid color vibration? For the colors to have a strong contrast, the color combinations in Splatoon must be both different hues and values. Let's see what happens if I take away the game's saturation. You can still tell the difference between the two kinds of ink. And this is actually, by the way, a very good test with most games and most uh, UIs in general. If you are somehow able to very quickly take a screenshot of your game or take something and just remove the saturation like this to make it black and white, the game should still be recognizable and still be playable in a way. Okay, I think this is a good, good test in in general i think and honestly I, I should do it more often as well based on the difference in the color's value some combinations contrast more than others but they all contrast enough to be effective the highly contrasting colors makes it easy to see your team's progress and even helps eliminate some of the need for voice chat even the color palette of the unpainted map was designed carefully to work with the strong palette of the ink colors the more washed out and neutral color palette of the terrain contrasts against the reflective and neon colored ink. So in this case, it would be, in my opinion, a little bit of a wrong example, because uh, although most of it is, but then you have like the kind of uh, like that separation at the end, which is the same color as the ink or very similar. I think that is actually something that might have been <laughs> mistaken, but yeah. It makes that, it obvious yeah. what that, isn't, yeah, isn't painted. Unsaturated. It's clear that a lot of thought went into the design of Splatoon's color palette, how it impacts the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, and how it fits into the world's style. Bad design. Behold! Programmer menus! Yatsugarasu, Attack on Cataclysm. I feel attacked. <laughs> it's got some nice character portraits, and it is functional. But these menus... Ooh boy. All right, rapid fire graphic design problems. Ready, go. Arcade, arcade. Key config should just be in the options. Grammar check your menus. This main menu has no composition. It's all just centered type with no frame. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, this is something that I also uh, kind of despise, which is whenever like you make a menu and the first thing you think of is just, oh, you just put a background image and then you center the, the a column of text. And it's just like, just think about it a little bit more, you know, make your menus a little bit more interesting if you can, you know? Framing or additional elements to support it. In the character select, all of this text is misaligned. All of this text is misaligned and they tried adding spaces to cover it up. This chif. These gorgeous character portraits make the whole thing look like a bootleg copy of a different fighting game. Announcers are digitized photos that look like Mortal Kombat 1. Announcers names I mean that's just that's weird. I don't know who made this game, but overlap weird. other pieces of text. I feel like this is just like a fan game. What is this mystery smudge? Seven fonts. Again, the thing about the the access of fonts is not necessarily that bad. Like it depends on the situation. Like in this, for example, sure. I mean, I, I think guest, for example, instead of being like a regular font, it could have used, for example, the, the same as the uh, the taking damage or the the or the number itself. But like, it's not that bad. The fact that the hit and the 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 timer is in different fonts that not necessarily bad. The fact that win is in a different font is not necessarily bad. And the fact that 
those two are different from the actual guy talking. It's not necessarily bad. I, I don't think it's uh, yeah, not necessarily bad. It's just if you can reduce it, maybe do so. This speech bubble doesn't know when to stop. Boop. The TV ran out of toner. These hit sparks look stolen. K comma O. K comma O. What? This was released in 2015. Hire a graphic designer. Good design. <laughs> but then again, that, that feels like a like a fan game or like a, yeah, like a meme game. You know, if you've seen any of my other videos, that I love me some kinetic typography. And Danganronpa, especially Danganronpa V3, has some of the most beautiful kinetic typography. Because, like, the thing here, for example, he doesn't mention it, but there's also a lot of fonts. Like, you've got the names, name and the status is in a different font. You've got the, the big text in the middle, a different font. Uh, like, Evidence of Struggle is a different font. Truth of Bullets is technically the same font that, uh, as the names and status. And then the the... The timer is also a different font. So you've got here, what, four fonts? So it's, you know, four, fair enough, it's not seven. But uh, yeah, there's still a lot of fonts regardless. Photography out there. It's just that sometimes it works. If it's well done, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a bad thing. In a nutshell, Danganronpa is a visual novel series, similar to Zero Escape and Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney. 16 hyper-talented high school students are forced to join a killing game where the only way to escape is to get away with murder or die trying. It's high school anime Hunger Games, soaked in a marinade of gallows humor, outlandish mysteries, and surprisingly deep characterization. Danganronpa's presentation is striking, especially for a visual novel. The cardboard cutout character sprites and objects with deliberately incorrect perspective gives the game a distinct pop-up book style but where the presentation truly shines is in the class trial segments. Here, the surviving students must debate who among them is the murderer. Fail, and the murderer gets away while the innocent students are executed. It's this class trial concept <laughs> presents much. a design challenge. How do you turn a group discussion into gameplay. Danganronpa's answer is what they call the non-stop debate. During these debates, characters will speak one after the other, providing their testimony and arguments for what happened, all of which is presented in kinetic typography. It's up to the player to see through the chaos of the debate and literally shoot through the weaknesses in your opponent's arguments with your own pieces of evidence or truth bullets in order to move the conversation forward. I guess it's very similar to, uh, to Phoenix Wright. Think Phoenix Wright mixed with a light gun game like House of the Dead. I this guess, but the difference is that you have to react uh, at the moment, which is actually quite nice. Uh, yeah. This whole series has some great... But again, this this seems very similar to uh, something like Persona 5, which is like all, like very all over the top type uh, presentation. Which is great if it's done properly. But V3 shows players this series' of style at its absolute best. I love the opening of every non-stop debate. The camera spins around everyone as your truth bullets load up, perfectly setting the stage. From there, it jumps right into the discussion. Type comes in from all directions as characters make their statements. The type itself... But this thing, the thing is, this works because of the setting in the game, but like having... Uh text like what from all over the place is not necessarily a good idea like it works because they created it they created a kind of shooting game kind of like one of those arcade games where like you have guys popping up everywhere uh they kind of mix it with that which is why it works but in other scenarios having text pop in from other locations in the screen would not necessarily work it's very difficult to follow i mean it's it's on purpose in this in this case which is why it works but in other scenarios it wouldn't work self is simple bold and beautiful, and is loaded with personality through composition and animation. Words will intersect, overlap, and fly across the screen with- But it's, it's uh, it definitely like a lot of work to make it work properly. Because as you say, it's like very good composition. It's like for each scene, you have to know where the text is going to come in, 
uh, you know, how is it going to interact with the other texts? Is it going to overlap? Is it going to be over, behind, etc.? And this is like, if it's done properly, it's a lot of, lot of work, but if it's done properly, it's going to get a good result for sure. With keywords being highlighted to help narrow down the number of options the player must consider. This was all present in the previous games, but V3 brings this idea further with different variations of the non-stop debate, including the even more chaotic panic debates where multiple arguments happen simultaneously, one-on-one -on -one debates where you refute your opponent by carefully cutting through their words, and the splitting scrum debate where you match the arguments of the opposing sides. The composition in the scrum debate where the cast faces off against each other in this profile shot just looks incredibly cool. Every version of the non-stop debate revolves around the same core challenge of just finding the heart of the problem, and the typography plays well into that. It's chaotic, but it's not overwhelming, and it matches thematically with the high stakes of the death game. I think, yeah, it works because of the, the setting, for sure. Bad design. It can be easy to forget that Final Fantasy VI was created for 25-year-old hardware. In spite of the limitations of the SNES, FF6 was extremely atmospheric for its time. The stormy title card, the use of Mode 7 to create that somber opening of the Magitek armor trekking through the snowfield. But like in, in a lot of ways, like the old uh, Final Fantasies have that design by necessity in many ways because. You can't really present because the, the amount of choices of abilities of attacks that you could had, you couldn't really present the, the 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 information to the player straight away, and you had to go through multiple menus. That is, I want to do an attack, and I want to do this attack, and then this attack. I have to do it against this guy. So it's many many clicks to do one attack, and that in a way is bad design. But there's not much choice that they had in 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 that that way. They they were forced to do it because of the, the limitations. I the guess, charming, the goofy cutscenes that would play the in the middle of boss fights. The opera scene. FF6 embraced its 16-bit limitations in ways that created its own personal style. Its sprite work is beautiful, and the graphic design, while not exactly a looker, did its job. Now enter the 2016 remaster. FF6. The problem with a remaster is that nowadays you can do it better. And if you do it again, like I've seen, for example, demos on Itch and stuff of people doing uh, JRPGs and stuff, which, and they still use the same structure. And that has stuck in many games as well, which is just, you choose whether you are an attack or an ability, and then you choose which one, and then you choose the target and so on. And it's just like so many clicks for one simple thing. And it's like, nowadays you can do it better. On PC it's is one of the really worst looking remasters, that, that period. They took a rough looking interface and made it even uglier. The ATB bars are now bizarrely shown through the menu panning up from the bottom. Design decisions made to work with a mobile screen kill the experience on the PC, like these ginormous buttons that show less information on the screen than in the original. The overly clean and basic looking typography has no personality or tone sticking out like a sore thumb against what's left of the game's 16-bit style. The thing is, yeah, it's a basically... Because if you look at the difference here, when he shows... The overly clean uh, and basic from one to the other, from the has old no one personality the... or tone. Sticking out like a sore... Here, this is the, old, the new one. ...sore thumb against what's left of the game. So it's basically the same. They basically redid, redid exactly what you had before. And again, like I'm saying, previously was pretty much a limitation. There wasn't much choice as to how they could do it. But nowadays you can do it style. so much better. Even the localization got worse. The script got wordier without getting better. Even the title screen was butchered. Look at this. What's this gradient? Where's the drama? There's no animation. The logo just appears. The work put into the game makes it look cheaper. More like a ROM hack than a remastering. And it's really tragic. FF6 is an all-time classic that deserves a great remaster to introduce a new audience to this beautiful game. Good design. From the beginning, Little Big Plant has always been about the creativity of its players. Its secret strength is how it makes a large and complicated toolset easy to use with a console controller. Mm -hmm. And it does all this with its Poppet menu. The Poppet menu is your main creation tool 
used for things like character customization, decoration, and of course, making levels. Little Big Planet has an extremely large amount of options to choose from. Hundreds of costume pieces, decorations, stickers, level geometry, logic tools, cinematic tools, materials, and so on. It could have been a huge pain to sort through all of your options, but the pop-up menus are energetic, well-organized, and easy to navigate with simple white animated iconography and clean typography. Objects are placed in a grid structure and are sorted by category and nothing feels out of place. Materials, decorations, stickers, costumes, and gameplay objects are all given their own section that you can flip through with the shoulder buttons. You can hide entire sections quickly and get your more commonly used items in one place, so finding and sorting what you need is super easy. All level creation, decoration, and editing is done with the Poppet's cursor. I haven't Pick played it myself, object, but it's very light. Resize, game, so rotate, and move it to that. where you want, and then just place it down. And you can even undo or redo changes with one button press. Making the common things easy lets you pour more time into the creative side of level design, instead of wrestling with your options. The Poppet also has some really smart decisions built in for multiplayer. Each player can use their own Poppet menus without disrupting each other. The Poppet also shows you what other players are doing which lets you work together more easily. Keeping track of your cursor is easy as the cursor itself has a string attached to your character, which lets you know who is building what. It's amazing how the developers of Little Big Planet have taken level creation, something that drags down dozens of games under the weight of its options, and makes it so seamless and easy without sacrificing and, and, the creative yeah. free- And the big difficulty that they did here is they did it for console, so it's like because one thing is, you know, you can use a keyboard and a mouse, but like to actually use uh, uh, a gamepad for it is actually quite Dome impressive. Of its players. Bad design. Here we go again. Mario Party A. Yeah, no, it's Battleborn. There is a lot to nitpick here, but let's zero in on this. Battleborn has a problem with focus and how it directs the attention of its players. Its UI elements are all very flashy and there are a billion of them. Battleborn is a busy looking game to begin with. It has MOBA yeah. style characters with crazy special attacks and tons of particle effects. Having the UI scream for attention on top- so The thing is, compared to, to the first game, for, to uh, how is that called? The, the squid <laughs> team uh, painting game. I don't know how it's called now. Anyways. Like where I said that the UI was very simple and that we had pretty much nothing here, like he's saying, is the opposite. So in this case, first of all, you've got a very big mini map, a, a top screen, which is not too big, it's fine. Then you've got the, both bottom screens, which are somewhat okay. But then outside of that, you've got the left, top left that shows the destroyed thing, who's attacking you with this little thing. And then you've got all of the different characters as well. It seems maybe a little bit too much. And then what he's saying mostly is that the, there's a lot of visual effects that disrupt the... the you, you can't see if you have all these like bombs and shit Top of all, all over that the place. is just a bad choice. For this kind of multiplayer MOBA shooter hybrid, the player's attention needs to be on the action of the game, not the framing around it. Battleborn's contemporaries like Overwatch and League of Legends understand this. They have stylish UIs, but the events within the game are still the most important component of the visual design. In the UI for Battleborn... But I would, have to, I would like to compare this with Overwatch, because Overwatch is a very well-designed game, and uh, you still have a lot of visual effects happening in the, in the screen, right? So I would still like tries to, to compare grab your that attention to by it. being as bold, vibrant, and animated as possible. During big fights, your screen will be flooded in particle effects, auras, light boxes, damage numbers, flashing indicators, cooldown indicators shield and health but like that's fine the cooldown indicator i don't know why he focuses on the cooldown indicators that's fine vignetting player outlines and status icons every time you get a kill assist or complete an objective big or small a fancy little animation will play in the upper left corner all of these ui indicators pop off constantly that and they like cover a, a bit too big much, chunk yeah, of the screen every time they play but again like I don't necessarily think that the, the problem as well with it is that they it seems to be designed for uh, for mobile which means that or or yeah for 
console, I guess, which means that the UI use tends to be a lot bigger. Because if you would do that on PC, you probably could, uh, you know, make these UIs slightly smaller, take less of the space. And mostly, I think definitely the the top left thing you could probably just Battleborn's go UI that is way. so over the top that it starts to look like one of those fake games built for a TV show. Good design is often an exercise in restraint. Just because you can design an element in a flashy way doesn't always mean you should. If there's going to be an animation for completing an objective, it needs to be fast and out of the way. Important icons shouldn't okay, have yeah, to be here, for example, if you compare to this, the difference is that the UI is a little bit smaller. First of all, the, the both the bottom left and bottom right are also transparent instead of having like a big squared border which isn't so in this case even though you have that ui element you can still see through it and the same for the top right as well but then you, the only difference the only real difference compared to uh, the other game that he was talking about is that there's no nothing happening in the top top left right but that's mostly it and it, it, it is a lot more subtle i think in most the ui is most subtle and it does, I think what, one of the things that Overwatch does is it has a lot of, uh, it gives a lot of information through the announcer itself instead of going through UI and stuff. So whenever you get killed, you get a small like icon in the middle and that's about it. The rest of the things, whenever you get objectives and so on, those happen through the, through the announcer. It needs to be fast and out of the way. Important icons shouldn't have to compete. And probably, yeah, probably they just happen faster. For your well. attention with less important ones. Each element must harmonize. Uh, although Smite is also a uh, uh, you know a renowned game, I guess it it is a little bit difficult. I mean, League of Legends, well, because the, the games themselves are quite difficult. The, if you don't know how to play, it can be difficult to actually understand what is happening. I think Smite more uh, than League of Legends. I think it's the perspective itself helps as well. Uh, but yeah, like Smite, you could argue as well that it, it is nice with the rest as well. of the experience. Your UI should be a symphony, not a shouting match. Good graphic design is not easy to make, but understanding what goes into making it will let you appreciate their work just a little more. And, and again, uh, one of the things that I think is important in design in general is that usually you have to take into account that less is more. So if you can go uh, with giving the information just a very needed information, Giving the user there's just the needed information instead of trying to give him every little information that you can is probably enough, you know? And uh, so if you can, yeah, try to avoid just cramming the space with trying to, oh, because you need to know the number of bullets, you need to know, uh, I don't know, the cooldowns and stuff, you need to know a lot of other stuff. So if you can make sure that you actually uh, realize what information is strictly necessary and just go from there. I guess. No, it's yeah, good video, like always, I guess. Uh, good examples. I mean, one of the best things you can do as well is whenever you're designing a UI, is just look at examples and uh, try to make an idea, I guess, because not all examples are necessarily good either. We can see it here, uh, but try to get an idea of what you like, what games, you know, that you play. Thought you thought you know the UI was was good, worked well. Uh, and then just try to go for there as long as it's and again I get a lot, I think uh, for me the most big aspects are functionality so in this video in, in last video he talked mostly about menus and in the video he talks more about like the actual uh, UI in-game UI which is which acts a little bit different like the in-game UI is what I said is just try to it needs to give you the most important information, the, the the really strictly necessary information and not go overboard with the amount of information. And it has to be uh, noticeable, but not clutter the space. A menu is slight the difference. A menu has to give you the information, it has to be usable, has to be easily comprehensible and try to reduce the number of clicks whenever you do certain things. And one of the things that are important as well is if you're playing your own game, make sure you maybe Every once in a while, just start like writing down the uh, things that you do in the menu and uh, how many times you do each of those. And then what you should do is try to look at the, the stuff that you've done the most, right? So I don't know, like I've changed the item of my character this many times, and this is the thing that I've done the most. So that should be something that uh, you can do very fast. You should really 
focus on reducing the amount of clicks for that specific action. And uh, and I think you should try to look at uh, UIs and menus uh, in that way to try to do the activities that you do more often. The actions that you do more often should be doable fast. And then certain things are a bit more, you know, miscellaneous, I guess, like changing the menus, the, the, the changing like the, the options and so on. Could take a little bit longer because it's something that you're not going to do often. Uh, but yeah, anyways, I think still a good takeaway from this video is like always, is, especially for, for interface UI is that less is more in, in many, many ways. And having good, a good presentation is always, it's obviously good. Uh, but having a good style with it is, uh, goes a long way as well. Anyways, that was it. So thanks for watching and uh, see you next time.